Uh, good morning, everybody. Proud to be here with y'all. Can't think of no place I'd rather be this morning. Uh, Jimmy's boy just walked in. Glad to see him, him here. Glad to have you guys. You got a pretty family. Good. Uh, me and Kim celebrated 40 years yesterday. I am so proud to have a wife that loves the Lord. Keeps me, keeps me straight. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, ain't it? She can write me off by now. She, she keeps me straight. She showed me that Emmanuel's got two M's in it. So I learned that this morning. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, thank you all for what y'all did with the church, Miss Gay. Um, yeah, you, you you do a lot of things for this church, ladies. You don't get thanks for it. We thank you. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Uh, I just want to share a little uh, verse with y'all from Psalms 95, 6 and 7. And uh, repeat after me, please. Come, Come. Let us bow down in worship. Let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God. Yes. Let's go to the Lord. Bless our times. Holy Father, we thank you so much for what you do for us this morning. I thank you for my wonderful wife. Wonderful wife. I know there's men here that, that have women that love the Lord, and it's, it's just I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't know what to do without you, Lord. Uh, just uh, pray for your God. It's your direction, everything that we do. I uh, just want to lift Brother Robert up. Just, Use him to show us the truth and the light. I'll lift our ties up to you this morning, Lord. Use them as a symbol of our love and our obligation to you. Um, just uh, thank you for your grace when we sin, Lord. Just um, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yesterday, today, and every other 
special right there yeah i know that's your song it's on your album you're on spotify man gosh and i'm here with you that's uh, i don't know how... well there you are and uh if you will turn to luke chapter two <clears throat> while you're turning i'm wondering how many m's are on the sign right now uh just kind of curious put a few things out here this morning just to kind of surround myself with some company. Uh, I don't know, maybe they ought to face out toward you. I don't know. Uh, you can buy these in a ranch supply, just saying, uh, if you want one for yourself. Just some of the, some of my uh, peculiarities. How about that? Luke chapter 2. Toward the end of the Luke account of what we normally read, the first 20 verses of Luke 2, right? And here's how it kind of wraps up. Talking about the shepherds says, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Let's pray. Wow. Father, we are honored, grateful to be coming into this season again, as it reminds us, as it reminds your world, 
who you are and what you did and the importance of Christmas. And I just pray that you would capture our hearts, capture our minds, capture our souls, capture us from wherever we are preoccupied and help us to hear you. Help us to breathe you. Help us to worship you. Speak to our hearts. We need you. We need the message of good news that the shepherds received for ourselves. Move me out of your way. In your name I pray. Amen. It's been an interesting two weeks for me, and without going into detail, I would just say that I went to bed Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. I was exhausted. And I think about once a month, I have a good night's sleep. That's where I am now. And I think Tuesday night, Wednesday morning was my night, my morning. Until 3.01 a.m. when the weather alarm went off. And uh, at the same time, I heard the siren in the community. And at the same time, and I grabbed my phone to kind of see where the storm happened to be from the warning and realizing where it was in proximity to those in my life and myself. And, and I heard what was going on outside, and I am not the normal person to move to the center of the house to find the place for shelter, but it was the worst storm I had heard the whole time I've been here. The hail and the rain and something, it just might, sounds like something was coming loose in my house. And I began to pray for about 10 minutes. I think that's about how long it lasted. Entered that day, went on about my day, and I have some dear, dear friends in Texas, Denby and Stephanie Cherry. I hope everyone has someone in your life that when you encounter moments, you invite them to pray for you, you know there's something about their prayers as if they have a hotline to God that maybe others don't have. And it's not that they do, it's just they, they evidently have the spiritual gift of praying. And Stephanie is like that, and I'd already shared some of, you know, a little bit about now I've lost my voice a couple of weeks ago, and just all that. And, and so I'd shared, and I received a text from Stephanie Wednesday night, about 9 o'clock. She said, how are you feeling? And I just said, uh, I'm wrung out, ha. Huh? <laughs> and... And I proceeded to tell her about today. And the last thing I put on there was the storm. She texted back, friend, this is wild stuff. I've been praying for you. I woke up at 2 and prayed and walked around until 3.45 a.m. And I just responded back, said, you were praying for me at between 2 and 3.45? And she said, I did. I woke around 2 with a jolt. And I said, and I came to mind, I'm, I'm trying to process this. I'm still trying to process this. She said, yes. She says, I don't normally wake up with uh, a rush of adrenaline. I pondered that some more. And later I texted back and I said, it kind, it's kind of awesome that the father awakened you in Texas to pray for me at the exact time, even before prayer was needed. It makes me wonder what mountains were moved. By the way, they don't have television. They don't watch the news, so they had no pre-idea of what was unfolding. It's the season to ponder and to wonder. And I pray and I hope that you get some of that because there is much to ponder and wonder. As a matter of fact, from that account, I paraphrase, sorry, the Apostle Paul, I paraphrase 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has entered into the heart of any human being what God is doing now for those who love him, because he is. He is always at work. He never stops working. He never stops looking over us. There's no telling. I think when we get to heaven, one of the things we'll receive is a big volume, volume one. You go read this for a thousand years and you see all the intricacies and the ways that God has worked in your life. And you'll be like, oh, I'm ready for some more praise and worship as if you needed that mode. I think we'll, it will be revealed to us. And this season is a time to just get a lot of that, you know. Have you ever had too much Christmas? Is there such a thing? It's 
It's kind of like the years ago, Daryl Singletary, country singer, had a song, too much fun. Too much fun, what's that mean? It's like too much man, m money. There's no such thing. It's like a girl too pretty with too much class, being too lucky, a car too fast. No matter what they say I've done, I've never had too much fun. <laughs> and I don't believe I've, any of us have ever had too much Christmas. There's something about entering into this time of year. And yet our world is trying to get us to rush through it so, and by the way, this is absolutely beautiful. I think this is the most beautiful I've ever seen this church decorated. The world would like us to, as quick as Christmas is over, take those puppies down and put it all in a box and let's move on. And I'm like, no, 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 no. When Christmas arrives, the day itself, we're just getting started. It's a special time of year. I mean, and just to be drawn into the manger, to spend some time just looking at what God did there. When you consider Jesus, this is he who gave up heaven's splendor to share in humanity's squalor. This is he who helped his father change nothingness into creation, and now he can't even change himself. That infant is our savior. That baby is is our king, that child is our Lord. And at Christmas time, Christmas time, the world's focus is momentarily directed to where it ought to be, at least in the right direction. And I know in the age and time we're living in, it's getting less and less so, but still it's there, this draw. And I just ask, can there be too much of this? I don't think so. And I could really only think of one person in Christmas, in the Christmas story, that might have been so overwhelmed that they were like, this is too much Christmas. And you know who that person is? That person was Mary. I think Mary. Because of what it says here, there in Luke chapter 2, it says, when they had seen him, talking about the shepherds, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The first Christmas here, as we read it, is drawing to a close. The angel choir had returned to heaven's practice hall. The shepherds are returning to protect their flocks. The manger is momentarily peaceful. Joseph and Mary doze in and out of wonder. It's been quite an experience. A long sojourn on the back of a donkey culminating in a long labor in an animal shed. The young couple's earlier shame melts in the presence of this child. Something about being around a baby. Joseph puts behind him the fact that this child is not his. He accepts what the angel has told him in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. This child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. But the next verse says, but Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, I've always thought that that verse, verse 19, is a strange way to end the Christmas story. On that first Christmas day, during that first 24-hour period, Mary had experienced too much Christmas overload. <laughs> Not too much Christmas to handle so that she was glad to have it over with and Let's move on. No, too much Christmas to comprehend in one setting. The past nine months had been like a rocket trail, and Christmas Day was the explosion. Mary would spend a lifetime pondering this. So she treasured up all these things. Barclay's translation reads, but Mary stored up these things in her memory. Cotton Patch Gospel. And Mary clung to all these words. When Jesus first came that Christmas, he, he brought his mother some Christmas presents. In, in advance, he, he sent some ahead. His advent and an arrival gave Mary much treasure. First, there was the visit of Gabriel. <laughs> I've never been visited by an angel that I knew of, at least that had wings and all that stuff. And you know, he visits her, Gabriel visits Mary, he had addressed her as the one who was highly favored among women. He had announced that she should give birth to a son who was to be born the son of the Most High. 
He had commanded her to name the baby Jesus. And when she questioned the possibility of such a birth, since she was a virgin, Gabriel informed her that she would be impregnated by the Holy Spirit, that God himself, the creator himself, would place the seed in her womb. Surely Mary treasured the amazing months that followed as her body showed evidence of what Gabriel had stated. Mary also treasured her visit with her cousin Elizabeth. She was six months pregnant, Elizabeth was, with John the Baptist, little baby John the Baptist. And she told Mary how her baby leapt at the sound of her voice. I mean, such wonder there. Shortly after her son's birth, Mary was again given treasure when suddenly, out of nowhere, night herdsmen appeared, chatting excitedly about the appearance of a single angel who directed them to witness the newborn's arrival. And then to top it all off, not only did they have a single angel, suddenly they had an angel chorus singing, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Those laughing, beaming, goofy shepherds, that's how I pictured them, had pleasantly interrupted their night of wonder. And Mary treasured up all these things. She scooped Christmas up and clasped it to her heart. The imperfect active verb here in the Greek means she kept on treasuring up these things. You know, it wasn't just a passive thought. No, she was like, oh, well, just continually. She says, it says, the word says, and it, she pondered them in her heart. Not only did she treasure them, she pondered them. Again, the Barclay translation says, and in her heart, she kept wondering what they meant. Cotton Patch Gospel. And Mary clung to all these words, turning them over and over in her memories. Just turning them over and over, thinking about them. The message says, Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within herself. It was too much Christmas to comprehend all at once. She was pondering. That's the Greek verb, an old Greek verb, son by yusa. It means placing together for comparison. She was in her mind, repeated Gabriel's announcement and compared it to the shepherd's testimony. And guess what? They agreed. She took what Joseph had told her about his angel visit and she compared it to her own and they jihad. <laughs> that, would show, that ought to be in the Cotton Patch Gospel, by the way. <laughs> she took what she had been told and laid it down next to this little being there in the crib and it was a perfect match. And again, Mary kept on pondering is the way it says it in the Greek. She was not astonished or shocked as much as she was filled with holy awe. There's a gift I would love to give each of you somewhere in these next few days to be filled with holy awe. Within Mary, the wellspring of Christmas overflowed into every day of her life. She never ceased to be amazed. And I just again ask, can there be too much Christmas? Can there be too much wonder? Well, you know, if you've forgotten what wonder is, adults, I'm not going to, you could look up. I mean, there's the display above the heavens all the time, but I want to encourage you to look down. Look down, not look down your nose, but look down and just gaze into the faces of children this time of year. They know what wonder is. They do. They're, they're excited. They're anticipating. Uh, they are full of wonder. There can never be too much wonder in the world. As a matter of fact, it seems to be in short supply. We need to learn from the generation behind us. We just do. I remember the John Wayne movie, The Alamo, and there's a scene in the movie where he picks up Captain Dickinson's little daughter and he gives her, or she gives him a hug good night. And then John Wayne, Davy Crockett turns to, to Travis and Dickinson and he says this, he says, kids, it's a shame they got to grow up to be people. <laughs> what was he saying? He was saying that all too soon wonder gives way to worry. 
Innocence gives way to iniquity. Fascination gives way to frustration. Marvel gives way to monotony. We need to take a lesson from Mary. For Mary's place is our place too. The Bible says this child has been born to us too. So we should treasure up all these things and ponder them in our hearts too. This holiday should be our year-round source of refreshment. We should never be able to get enough Christmas, just as it should be impossible for us to consume enough wonder. I think of what Baptist preacher of yesteryear, Vance Habner, said about Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith, the same one, he said, draw the circle around yourself and pray for revival. That Gypsy Smith, he said this about Gypsy. He was an active preacher, preached for 70 years, and when he was asked the secret of his freshness and of his vigor, vigor and how he could preach into his old age, Smith replied, I have never lost the wonder. I've never lost the wonder. Oh, that's what we need, to never lose the wonder. Never get lost from the sight of Christmas. We should never cease to be amazed if we ever stopped, if we never, if we would never cease to be amazed if we never stopped treasuring and pondering Jesus Christ. Can there be too much Christmas? Can there be too much wonder? Can there be too, can there be too much joy? Somewhere between Thanksgiving and New Year's, the world, people just seem to lighten up a little bit because they know they need to. The closer we get to the stable, the closer we return to what we wish the world was. I remember in the Barge household growing up, we were forbidden to play Christmas music until the day after Thanksgiving. But on that day, down the hall I would go, the hall closet up at the top of the closet where my mom and dad's vinyl records, I would pull them down. And one of the first songs I would play is Eddie Arnold's Christmas Can't Be Far Away. really liked that song, the 1962 version. The words go this way. It says, a neighbor tipped his hat to me this morning. The landlord even smiled and said, good day. And I want you to know a stranger said hello. Christmas can't be far away. The old tightwad down the street is buying candy to pass out to the neighbor kids at play. The town is on the go. The weatherman said, snow, Christmas can't be far away. Both young and old are planning sweet surprises. They'll soon be tied with ribbons bright and gay. Goodwill is in the air. You feel it everywhere. Christmas can't be far away. Perhaps our joy comes in anticipation of what we might receive but the possibility of greater joy awaits us in what you could least expect. And I hope you just picked up what I laid down there. You know, we get so focused on what we're going to get or what we think we're going to get or what we think is going to happen. That's not how the Holy Spirit usually sneaks up on us, is it? John Killinger in his book, Christmas Spoken here, he wrote this. He said, Zechariah and Elizabeth didn't expect to have a baby in their old age. Mary didn't expect to be the mother of the Son of God. Joseph didn't expect his young bride to be pregnant. Herod didn't expect to be disturbed by the word of this child. The shepherds didn't expect to see angels in their fields. The Magi didn't expect to find the Savior of the war world born in a manger in a poor little village like Bethlehem. The whole thing was a surprise. God surprised everyone that first Christmas. You look over this list of surprised persons and you will see that Herod was the only one who did not respond to that first Christmas with joy. All the rest found Christmas to be of exceeding great joy. I mean, you've got Elizabeth, and Zechariah, and Mary, and Joseph sharing in the joy of being a new parent, right? You got the shepherds and the wise men. They found joy in the journey to, to meet the child. There is joy in discovering that God has given us his son Jesus. And in that gift, we have everything we will ever need. Can there be too much Christmas? Can there be too much joy? Can there be too much wonder? And finally, can there be too much love? Can there be too much love? Have you ever once turned on your television, watched the news, turned it off and said, mm, there is just too much love in this world? 
I just wonder what the world would look like if Jesus had never been born. Would it be as C.S. Lewis described it in the Chronicles of Narnia? Always winter, but never Christmas. Without the celebration of Christmas, would soldiers around the world ever be issued the order to cease fire? Without Christmas, the celebration, how long would we go without speaking to that family member who ticked us off this year? Without the celebration of Christmas, how many missionaries would there be around the world? Growing up in the tradition of Southern Baptist, where this time of year, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, money given to support missionaries around the world. Today's the first day of the week of prayer for Lottie Moon. And all the money that has been received to support all the mission causes around the world. To me, the greatest thing about being a Southern Baptist. There could be Neither too much Christmas nor too much love. You see, God never loved the world too much. Instead, John 3, 16, what does it say? It says he loves us so much. For God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. So that whosoever will would accept his gift, place their faith in his gift, they would possess eternal life. Through the years, Mary's heart was a treasure chest of the gifts she had received that first Christmas. She knelt there to worship many, many times, I'm sure, as she pondered the magnificence of her son. Surely, she pondered these things again just eight days later when they took Jesus to present him at the temple, to present him to the Lord, and there they confronted Simeon and Anna. You can read about it on into Luke chapter 2. Surely she pondered these things again when suddenly her cache of memories were thrown open when these wise men showed up bringing gifts for, for the son, her son Jesus. And, and surely, I don't know how long, it, it, we don't believe the Magi showed up until almost two years later. Can you imagine going out at night cradling your little baby? looking up and there's a star hanging over where you reside. I mean, that had to be something just to, oh, what is going on here? <laughs> as, as Jesus grew up, I just wonder how many times she walked to the door and wiped her hands on her apron and watched her little boy play out in the yard. I wonder how many times Joseph and Mary reminisced when they gave birth to a new child, I mean, that's just what you do when you have one child. You think you compare it to the last. I wonder, they thought about, oh, you know, they brought them all the way back again to that unusual, strange birth of Jesus. And when she looked at her little boy out there, he just seemed to be different. I mean, he always seemed to be a peacemaker when the little boys were about to get into it. Christmas came back again when they lost Jesus on the way back to Jerusalem, when they found him sitting among the temple leaders intently listening to them and asking them questions, her Christmas wonderment was rekindled. You say, well, that's just in your imagination. Well, let me just tell you what, what it says in Luke 2 after they bring Jesus out of the temple and take him back home. It says Luke 2, 51, then Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. She's kept on treasuring. Kept on pondering. And I believe Christmas followed her into Jesus' adult years. His Christmas weathered amusement when she asked Jesus to save a newlywed couple from embarrassment who were about to run out of wine at their wedding. Christmas weathered confusion when she asked Jesus to come home because the household had taken a vote and they had come up with the conclusion that he is crazy. He's nuts. He's out of his mind. Time to bring you home now, Jesus. Too much Christmas even spilled over into her on Good Friday, long before we ever knew it as good. As Mary looked up as only a mother could into the barely recognizable visage of her son, surely she stood there at the threshold of his death, whose life had shown such promise. I think she must have pried open the treasure chest 
and nervously turned to Gabriel's testimony, his prophecy over and over in her head. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Then why is he hanging on a cross? The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Is this how they treat royalty? His kingdom will never end. Sure looks like the end to me. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Jesus Christ the Lord. No, today in the capital of David, a son has been torn from me. He is Jesus, my baby boy. Perhaps it was then that the ominous words of Simeon fell like a shadow. In Luke 2, when they saw Simeon there at the temple, Simeon said this, he said, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. He said this to Mary, he said, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary did not have the luxury of biblical foresight as we do, but three days later, as news trickled out of his resurrection from the dead, she knew once again the truth of Christmas. Too much Christmas overwhelmed her once more. So much so that a few years later, she gave permission to a physician by the name of Luke to write her story. Most theologians believe, Bible scholars believe, it was, it was Mary who was the source for Luke's chapter 1. In chapter 2, if you've watched The Chosen, well, you know, theologians agree, The Chosen agrees, because it's there as well. If Mary could stand before us this morning, I'm sure she would be the first to testify that there never could be too much Christmas, too much wonder, too much joy, too much love. For the potency of Christmas lies not in one's capacity to receive, nor in one's momentary set of circumstances rather it lies in the gift of God God gave himself God sent his son the most perfect gift ever given God's gift has never gone out of style and to this day it remains humankind's greatest need and it always will and the question for all of us this morning to ask individually is, have I received that gift for myself? Let's pray. You know us, you know our hearts, you know our need. You know all we are carrying around within us. You know whether we've surrendered our lives to you, Lord God. You know whether or not we have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. Father, your Holy Spirit is at work. May we continue to permit him to be at work. And however he is drawing us and leading us now, May we be as obedient as shepherds standing in the field who did not understand what was going on, but they received an invitation. And they went to see for themselves. Help us now. In your name I pray. Amen. Stand to see the one at the end.